Good evening, everyone. My task tonight is to introduce our distinguished scholar. <laughs> so, I'll begin. Dr. Bishara Saheli was born in St. Kitts. He was the St. Kitts and Nevis State Scholar in 1988. He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree with honors in biology from Dalhousie University in Canada in 1992, and he completed his MBBS in 1997 and his DM in internal medicine in 2003 at the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Six months of his electives in 2002 were spent at the University of Toronto in Canada in rheumatology, cardiology, and nephrology. He has returned home to serve his country as a consultant physician in internal medicine at the Joseph N. French General Hospital since 2003 to the present. He also has been in private practice since 2004. His recent interests revolve around the social, economic, and political determinants of health and disease, and he is investigating on how best to update our biopsychosocial models of medical practice to be fully life coherent with the protection of our social and planetary life support systems. The base of this exploration is the life value onto axiology framework of University Professor Emeritus John McMurtry, which provides the most comprehensive and coherently inclusive framework for taking into account all of the life value determinants of healthy developments at all levels of life organization. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Bishara Sahil. A pleasant good evening to everyone. Permit me to adopt the protocol established this evening. I'd like to recognize um, Honorable Van Samory, the Right Honorable Dr. Kennedy Simmons, Mr. and Mrs. Morton, and Lady Innes and family. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening and to present this memorial lecture in honor of Sir Probin Innes. You may or may not know that I was his private doctor and I had several opportunities to discuss many issues on life that were relevant to his life and that of the life of our community. What became clear very early on was that he was mourning the diminution of our liberating communal spirituality by an enslaving materialistic religiosity that had captured our political and economic systems of good governance and had created histories and legacies of mental enslavement of our people still yet unseen. In this light, I'm going to take a deep history and deep heritage approach to show from whence we came and to whither bound, to show how we can make the great turn to transform all of our rules of our social engagements so that they can uplift us to the highest heights and not lead us downtrodden to the lowest lows. So Probin had pride of place of Brimstone Hill in his heart, for it manifested the unbreakable spirit in the hearts and minds and backs and hands and feet of the slaves who built it as manifested in their superb craftsmanship. For him, this was proof of principle that no matter how diabolic the times were, that spirit could never have been extinguished and can now be tapped into as a source of transformation that guides our thoughts, feelings, and actions individually and collectively in comprehensive, inclus comprehensively inclusive and imaginatively creative life enabling ways. So without further ado, let's begin. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about health. I'm gonna to try to stay within my lane. Right, but it may be difficult, and if you find I'm going off track, just get me back on board. So what is health? According to the World Health Organization, health can be defined in the following ways. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Health also is a universal value, so there's a moral, ethical element there, it's a basic human right 
There's a political element there and a resource for everyday life. There's an economic element there. So I have lots of latitude. And this was gotten from Excellent that summarized, um, Excellent document that summarized what health is and the health of the nation is the wealth of the nation. So, no. so let's go. Is our health being enabled or disabled? So let's look at the regional and local data. Right? We have to find the vital signs of our countries. So what are the leading causes of death in CARICOM? Um, this was a chart that was presented at the CARICOM summit where the CARICOM was leading, bringing the issues of non-communicable diseases to the international agenda. And as we saw there, heart disease was number one, followed by cancers, diabetes, stroke, injuries, hypertensive disease, and HIV AIDS. Note that the disease that got the most publicity, advocacy, and financing was the lowest lying fruit. But a lot has, lots have been learned so that the, the lessons learned can be applied for the non communicable diseases. So it wasn't money that was less spent, but the return of, on investment for the other NCDs is now bearing fruit. Okay, this is the latest I found from our data, and this I got from National Consultation on Sugar Sweet Beverages prevented, presented by Dr. Leedy in 2008. And interestingly, there's been a flip. Cancers are now leading the way, followed by stroke, diabetes complications, myocardial infarction, and the injuries with gunshot wounds. So this is up to 2016. So it looks as if it was leading myocardial infarction. So rupture from without was leading more than blockage from within our heart. So that was mortality. So what are the risk factors? The number one risk factor is high blood pressure, right? Followed by overweight obesity, alcohol, smoking, high cholesterol, low fruits and vegetable intake, and physical inactivity, okay? And hypertension contributes um, its effect mainly on cardiovascular disease, overweight, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancers, alcohol, to injury and violence and neuropsychiatric conditions. And now NCDs are defined with mental illness and also with injuries as one. But here's the most interesting slide of all for me. The, the DALIs, Disability Adjusted light year, Life Years. So these are the healthy life expectancy years. What does that mean? You can live until you're 60 but have a stroke from age 30. So you've lost 30 years of productive life. Right? So this is the burden of disease, which we have to carry when these complications occur and you don't die. So this has ramification for social security, because if you have more people getting injured early and you have to support them, they become very dependent. So less people in the productive force, more people on disability. But alcohol is number one. We're not addressing this. There's another substance that has, I would say, no harms, or low harms, but is illegal, but has more medical benefits than alcohol. Alcohol doesn't have any medical benefit. All that we've been taught was marketing, right? And lots of harms. So alcohol should be legal, and if it isn't, and that other substance needs to be decriminalized and legalized. And I'm happy we are on that path. So we do have legal substances of abuse and harm. So legal doesn't make it right, right? Slavery was once legal, right? Apartheid was once legal, right? The Holocaust was once legal, right? So the rule of law you have to take with a grain of salt. Is the rule of men masquerading as rule of law? I'm going to turn everything upside down. 
You're going to get nauseous, but we have to go through that, that process. Okay, so high blood pressure is second, followed by overweight obesity, smoking, high cholesterol, low fruit and vegetable and physical activity, the classic ones. But for me, it was a shocker. I'm going to focus on obesity because there are parallels between the body economics, the body politics, and our internal environment, and our external social politics, economics, and external environment. GDP. Economic growth. Having infinite economic growth on a finite planet, right, was said to be the ideal dream of a madman or an economist. Obesity is the same thing. Increasing calorie recording and putting on weight. The same rationally think it's healthy. Healthy economy, healthy body economics. But it's not. After the 1980s, after the neoliberal turn, we found not only in Sanctuary but around the world an increase in, in obesity. Oh, okay. So when we say obesity, we're not talking about something cosmetic. We say fat is beautiful, but it's actually very unhealthy. Obesity is defined, it's a metric. That's defined by your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared, and you get a number. If it's above 25, then you're overweight. If it's above 30, you're obese. Okay? So it's not as if you're borderline obese. You can't be borderline pregnant or not. It's either you are or you're not. But let's start from the base. 20% 20, 20 of our women were overweight or obese, above 25. Ten years later, 40. Another ten years later, almost 60. We're kind of going up. This is in the 2000s. Another ten years later, 70. This was aggregated for the, the Caribbean. Now we're going closer to our islands. And what, what shocked me, St. Kitts, we had the fattest women in the Caribbean. Pardon me? Yeah. So we have one of the highest there. I mean, we lead in, in many ways in the Caribbean. I'm not sure if there's something to be proud of. Okay? And then we did the last step study in 2008. We do a survey to find out the pre prevalence of these diseases and their risk factors. And there's one that's currently being. Um, implemented right now. So we should start to get some data. Nevis already started in March 2008. And thank you, Nevis. Hey, we're still leading the pack. It's almost 75. Okay? I mean, what about our youths? I saw this from one of Dr. Martin's slide. Thank you, Dr. Martin. And from 1987, Obesity rates about 5%. It went up to about 12 and 2006. I, mean, I was trying to find more data, recent data, and in Dr. Liddy's presentation, she said a recent report from seven Eastern Caribbean countries shows that between 2000 and 2010, the rates of overweight and obesity in children aged 0 to 4 years doubled from 9.4, so ours was 12, to 14.8. So if the trends are the same, then I think this is probably an error. So we, ours was 12, they were 7.4 average. If there's 14.8, ours probably more, doubled. What about our adolescents? 20% of those 13 to 15 years. This was in 2005. One in five. And the Global School Health Survey of 2011 is up now. This is saying kids. 32.5% of children. One in three. Just stand up outside my subway, which was uh, lunchtime, and just look. Do your casual observation. Don't take my word for it. And 14.5% were obese. Right? This is overweight, obese. Okay? So, what's the root cause of all of this? So this is the question. To be or not to be obese, is that the question? Yes. So three things we have to consider. What's fat, adipose tissue? What's the final common pathway, atherosclerosis? And 
What is it associated with? What are the, the disease clusters? Well, fat is not just an energy store. It's one of the biggest endocrine organs. An endocrine organ is something that secretes signals, hormones, that coordinates the body function. When to store, when to release. And when it becomes stress, when we eat more than we should, and you get stress within the cells, you start to release a lot of hormones that cause inflammation. And inflammation is the body's response to injury. So if you have an underlying inflammatory condition like joint pains, asthma, you put on weight, it's like you're throwing gas on fire. Spillover effect. Okay? Everything becomes dysregulated. So you get inflammation, thrombosis is clots, hypertension, your blood pressure goes up, high LDL, that's the bad cholesterol that causes hardening of the artery, low HDL, that's the good cholesterol, that's the draino that cleans out your arteries, and high triglycerides, that's fat. It causes type 2 diabetes, and the final common pathway is atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, which can cause blockage. Now, atherosclerosis is a progressive pro process. The body just drops down from a heart attack or stroke or have the leg cut off just for spite. It didn't just happen yesterday. This process has been building up for years, for decades. The first process is silent. That's why we call it the silent killer. Because as you get all of these inflammation, high, high blood pressure and diabetes and inflammation, you get plaques. And the first initial plaque is, is called a fatty streak in a fibrous plaque. No symptoms. And then occlusive or atherosclerotic plaque. I mean, once it's more than 70%, then you start to have symptoms. So your reserves is 70%. So all of this is building up, depending on how you eat, until if you reach more than 70%. When you walk, you start to get this press in chest pain. That's called effort angina. And when you relax, when things slow down, so when the supply doesn't meet demand, you get low oxygen, you get increase of acid, lactic acid, it comes on. And when you slow down so that the supply now matches the demand, which is already compromised, the pain goes away. If it happens in the leg, we call it rest pain or claudication. Okay? And then, God forbid, the plaque ruptures. Boom! This doesn't kill you, it's just symptomatic. When it ruptures, all hell breaks loose. It's like a volcano inside, a pimple burst. And then all these gunk come out, the cholesterol crystals. And the vessels don't know that it's injured from within. It thinks it's got a cut from outside. And then what does it say? I need to block it up. I need to stop the bleeding. And what it does, it forms a clot. So it bursts, you form a clot. What happens to the tissue downstream? It becomes infarcted. And that's where the name myocardial infarction, it becomes necrosed, necrotic. So now, if you get the blockage early and you can give them clot blasting drugs before any damage downstream, you can save the tissue. If you're in a lab, you can do an angioplasty, open it up, you get the circulation flowing, then you can save the tissue. If you don't reach there in time, you're going to get some damage. That's what they call a myocardial infarction. But 25% die from sudden cardiac death. They die sudden, boom. Those are the lucky ones. Well, when you're dead, do you suffer? You're resting in peace. I don't know where we get that from. We should say we should always live in peace, but somehow rest in peace sounds better. But guess what? You leave in your absence lots of suffering. If you're the breadwinner, if you're a mother, you're a family member, you're a person with skill at the workplace and so on. So please don't be selfish and hope that you just die suddenly, painlessly. Okay? Because you know how karma is, okay? Now if it happens in one of the arteries in the brain, that's what we call a stroke. We call it a brain attack, like a heart attack. Cerebral infarction. If you just turn around the words, it's the same thing. And if it happened in the leg, we call that critical leg ischemia, which if not corrected, goes on to gangrene. So gangrene is what we see in the 
the brain, sorry, in the brain, in the heart, and also it's externalized in the leg. So just imagine how your foot looks, what's happening up there and in your heart. Okay? So what is teaches about the body politics? For the body to be healthy, right, you have to have integrity in plumbing life, right, and freedom of circulation flow. Because once you have the circulation of material and oxygen and information from the hormones not going where they should go to coordinate everything, and everybody's not in the loop what's happening in the body, then problem arise. So this is what medicine has taught me about the body politics, why integrity is important. Okay? This is bread and butter issues, life and death issues we're talking about here. And obesity, it's been, these are the classic effects. Now we realize that fatty liver is part of the process of obesity. But there's connections now to cancer, asthma, sleep apnea, arthritis, neurodegeneration like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and gallbladder disease. We, we're going to go a little bit deeper and find the root cause. Are you all... You want to go there? Deep history, deep heritage. And we have any vomit bags here because it's going to get very crazy. Okay. Just remember, this thing takes years. How do we know? Well, when the guys died in the Vietnam War in the 18, 20, they did post-mortems on them, and they saw the fatty streaks, the plaques. And it starts at the age of 10, earlier. That was before there was fast food. That's gas on fire. So our kids in the fives and threes who were born big, started earlier. So they have a head start for the strokes and the heart attack. So we know it's a process. So that's is not something to be pessimistic about, but optimistic about. So we have time to try to intervene upstream. Don't just, don't just focus on downstream on the factors that you see right away. So if you go upstream, we start to talk about risk factors and markers like hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, proximal, the cause, right? So what's causing that? This thing is obesity. What's midstream, the cause of the cause, and what's upstream, cause of the cause of the cause, right? Because we shouldn't be seeing ourselves as health mechanics waiting for you to break down. We should see ourselves as health coach, health coach advising you early on how to live a healthy life. So disease prevention and health promotion should be the cure of our system. So prevention is not only better than the cure, it's the cure. So preventive medicine makes sense. So if you have a TAPS open upstream that's causing all these problems, you don't want to invest in mops and water thing. It's going to keep going and going. It's good for business, but bad for health. And it's something you're going to realize everything is upside down diametrically opposed. It's a little bit busy, so I'll give you some insight. I don't know why they call this the natural history of disease. There's nothing natural. We should call this man-made history of disease. Right? So we start with societal and environmental determinants, then risk and protective factors, preclinical phases before you see any signs, you have the clinical phase, and you have the post-clinical phase. Right. So the post-clinical phase, after you have your stroke, heart attack, we call this tertiary prevention. So you modify risk factors and pathological processes to avoid relapses and further deterioration. So this applies to recovering individuals and all clinicians via counseling, follow-up care, and rehabilitation. So to prevent the next stroke, the next heart attack, and to, or to prevent death. Secondary prevention, so you detect and treat pathological processes early when intervention can be more effective. So these are patients with disease and also groups at risk. 
And here's with the family physicians via patient counseling, treatment, and risk factor change. Primary prevention now deals to alter the exposure that lead to disease. And I'm happy we're not talking about just risk factors, we're talking about protective factors. So we do have some control. We identify groups at risk, young kids, right, fam patients with family history of these disease. And here's this where public health comes in via the community action and screening programs. Screen is to pick up disease that doesn't manifest. So you don't feel your blood pressure, but you could only screen by checking it. And the last, and I think the most important one, is primordial pre prevention. So you alter societal structures and thereby underlying determinants. So these are structurally determined. So our structural environment determines whether we are healthy or diseased. And if we see this going up, Houston is a, or Bastard is a problem. If we turn an eye, like what we said, we have no gang problem. Later on, it's going to come back and bite us in our... And here what we do, we target healthy people before they get sick with information and knowledge. Okay? So the government and public health agencies uh, need to be involved via health promotion, social program, program, and most important of all, government legislative or fiscal and physical measures. Pass the laws that need to be passed and provide the funding that's needed. And I'm happy our PS is here. Okay? That's part of good governance, bread and butter issues, life and death. So this is a nice graph that shows you the upstream, so heart attack and strokes, atherosclerosis. These are the risk factors, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, right? So start with cardiovascular disease, metabolic risk factor, behavior factors. And these are unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and harmful use of alcohol. So basically, we're just only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, good thing we don't smoke much in St. Kitts. I mean, that's cigarettes, right? So we don't have the COPD emphysema as much as the developed countries. And this is where tertiary prevention comes in. Secondary prevention here, deal with the risk factors. Primary prevention, tobacco use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, harmful use of alcohol. And primordial prevention the social and environmental and economical and political and spiritual determinants of disease. You're not leaving anybody out there, all hands on deck. And of course, illiteracy, healthy literacy and poverty is obvious. Globalization, urbanization, isn't that progress? Isn't that civilization? And I like this one, quaternary prevention. Action taken to identify a patient or population at risk of over-medicalization to protect them from invasive medical interventions and provide for them care procedures which are ethically acceptable. Right? Because I am very embarrassed about my profession. Right? We profit off a disease. We become, have mercy, and we become legal drug pushers. Magistrate is here, so guilty as charged. <laughs> What's legally legal? Is it absolute, is it arbitrary or relative? Rule of law or rule of men? Mine, I didn't say women, rule of men. I'm happy I didn't say human made for all of these things. These are man made, and you'll find out why later on. Okay, so let's start with childhood obesity. I mean, this is the best I could get. Epidemic obesity, diabetes, vascular disease. Let's go upstream. Oops. So we live in an obese generating environment. So we call it an obesogenic environment. Poverty, we know that. High cost of fresh produce. Can't compete with, with um, processed food. Low access to good food, sedentary entertainment. And the kids now, they only exercise in a few muscles, right? Not the big muscles that burn fat and so on. Decreased physical activity. Social and family context of weight, means of high and low weight. If you're normal weight, they say you're sick. 
that is a disadvantaged person, but if you're fat and plump, you're healthy. So the cultural interpretation of these outward manifestation needs to be corrected. Low and high caloric fetal environments. During pregnancy, whether you, if you're underweight or overweight, this can cause maladaptive development. So you don't reach your full potential. You may develop diabetes early and obesity early because of programming. We call it fetal programming. Fetal programming is although you may have a fixed set of genes, it's the expression that depends on the lifestyle choices and the environmental exposures that determine whether good one's going to be turned on, that's protective, or bad one's going to be turned on. So your environment is your RAM, your software, that determines which of the ROMs become activated. Okay, so we like to think in IT terms, so if that can help you to understand, then we should go there. But this is the elephant in the room, fast food, as opposed to slow food. We should have more slow food in the Federation. There are no fast food places in Nevis, right? Local, okay. So what's funding this fast food thing? The mass media. I call these the disinformation mainstream media complex. Sorry. And what's driving that? Globalization. So what is it about globalization that's driving that? Global trade policy. When GATT was formed, they grandfathered the farms and arms that, so that is taken out of any of the agreements. So they can make they subsidize, the American government subsidized the corn and wheat industry so they can make the fast food cheaper. And if we decide in saying case we want to subsidize our farms, especially when you're under IMF programs, they blacklist you. Open borders, no, no restriction for international and domestic. Is this rule of law or rule of aggrieved men of privilege? So what has happened, the third, third world farmers was put out of business. They can't compete. And the word industrialization, mechanization, with mass media. Farmers need to find work. They need to earn a living. I thought when you're born, you, you're guaranteed a life, so you should be guaranteed a living. And that's why universal basic income makes sense. We have it here under a different name. Right? Job guarantee, if you follow modern monetary theory, talking about universal job guarantee. If you have idle hands and idle resources, let the government to the treasury print the money that's needed to mobilize it. That's investment in the people. And we have some of that here in St. Kitts already, right? We were far ahead of these people. We just didn't know it. We're very smart. Right? But we let our politics color our interpretation depending on which side and who's in. Right? Right is wrong, depending on who's in. Right, Chester? <laughs> a lot of my patients here, so I'm, I may do a little bantering. So let's keep it airy. And I didn't have any spliff this evening, so don't, don't worry. Okay. Um, so urbanization, immigration. They come there, they have to work. So clustered, more stress, decreased immune system, more diseases. But guess what? We're talking about climate change. It's all connected. It's one space. That which you do to me, you do to the other. That which you do to the other, you do to me. I am because we are Ubuntu. So let's, let's work backwards again. Biological pathology, diabetes, cardiovascular cancer. It's inflammation. Inflammation is the body's response to injury. So this is metabolic inflammation, metabolic injury. We develop what's called insulin resistance. You're eating all that fast food. If we didn't develop insulin resistance, we'll become 1,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds. So this is a normal response to abnormal environment. So what's the driver here? The environment. So overnutrition, inactivity is what's leading that. You go up higher, 
energy use, high caloric dense food, social pressure and peer pressure that facilitates overconsumption. You're eating more than you need and not exercise as much as you should. Social environment, peer pressure, and the disinformation mainstream media complex is aiding and abetting in this crime against our children and humanity. Industrialization, population, and economic growth. This, every time I see we need economic growth, I want to vomit. We have too much bad growth. We need good, healthy growth that stays within the means of the planet to satisfy the needs of everyone. When we live in sufficient abundance, we just waste a lot. Let's go downstream. So this is individual global. Energy use, overproduction, overconsumption, waste. Increase in temperature, ocean acidity. Well, this reminds me, Earth has a fever and has metabolic acidosis. Mother Earth, she's a living entity. And she's having a fever. She's having a cough and sneeze. I don't think there's a coronavirus equivalent for Mother Earth. When the winds get very high, the waves go up. Right? When you have flooding, she has diarrhea. The trees are the lungs of Earth. The soil is the digestive system that recycles everything, processes everything for the plants. The mountains are the bosoms of Mother Earth. The clouds, so the wind goes, condenses, clouds is the milk, the manna from heaven. The rivers and the streams are a circulatory system, and gravity and the sun works to ensure that the thing keeps circling. So we've been pillaging and raping her. When we take out more, that's more than her regenerative capacity, and we pollute, pollute her. Once you finish, you're going to see everything holistically, in an integral way. Ecological inflammation, so ecological damage, carbon resistance. Now we know that the soil is what takes up most of the carbon dioxide, not the plants. And just planting trees is not going to work. We have to afforest, I mean, stop cutting down the forest. Because it takes thousands of years to create soil with organic matter. That's where you store it there. Let me tell you, you're going to get scared after all of this because we're going over a cliff and instead of pressing the brakes, we're hitting the accelerator. Woohoo! Reminds me of those cartoons we used to see. We used to run off. Maybe they were preparing us for, for this year because it's been predicted that 2020 is when everything collapses. And no vomit bowls as yet, no? Okay. So ecological pathology, storms, sea rise, level rise, and extinctions. We go into the belly of the beast. So people, planet, and living things are at the base. Government is close to us, but we have a corporacy, corporations. And you have the big banks, Wall Street banks, Right, so this is the U.S. version of the international central banking scam. We all know that they create money out of thin air by just instantating loans. To pay off all the loans, the money system would collapse. And they make sure that they only create the principal, but you have to pay back the interest. So they manufacture cases, so we're always fighting among ourselves. Everybody becomes a designated enemy. You, you play this with game theory. It's a system that amplifies advantages and disadvantages. So the richer will always get richer, and the poor will always get poorer. You have the international central banks, IMF and World Bank, and you have the central bank of all central banks, right? the banks of international settlement. But what you notice, where's the money going? Up. So it's not no trickle-down economics, it's siphon up. Now what, four to six men have more wealth than half of the population of this earth? That's obnoxious. But what comes down to us? Domination, control, and arms. Right? Destabilization. So, and it's very strategic. 
So in the Western Hemisphere, we use gangs, drugs, and guns. In the Middle East, terrorists. In the US, the same thing. Keep people fighting among themselves so they don't see what's happening up there. But guess what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They would, some of them are born with riches, but they're only doing the best they can given what they understand. If they knew better, they would have done better. Because we all have a conscience. Sometimes it goes to sleep. And I don't think people are born, although they say, psychopaths or sociopaths. I don't think that's... God wouldn't have created people who were like that. They were manufactured by the system. So it's a system disorder that needs to be fixed. And guess what? No one government, no one region, no one hemispheric block can solve it on their own. It has to be a all of we in this thing together. The Caribbean rallied for NCDs. We need to take it up to a higher state. This was in 1922, and this has been known back then. Henry Ford. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. But if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. At one of the Bilderberg conferences, Rockefeller, he thanked the media for being silent. They want a one-world government. And if you read the things that were leaked out, he doesn't think nicely of nation states. They want international bankers, international financiers to control the narrative. And if you look at Bush or the two Bushes before Obama, they were always talking about the New World Order. But in 2008, they discovered a fundamental flaw in the system. So, so that's one aspect of globalization is the control, the circuits that kind of depletes the base of the planet and our societies. But this was a guy, this is a psychologist, and he wrote this book called The Globalization of Addiction, a study in the poverty of the spirit. And I remembered some of the discussions I had with Sir Probin when he was mourning our loss of spirituality. We were very religious. Our population didn't grow much, but we, our churches were proliferating. So we were diluting that sense of community within each church. Why is that? I thought we should be coming together instead of drifting apart. And then he realized from his experience that psychosocial integration is a necessity. And that globalizing free market society produces mass dislocation and people use addiction as a way of adapting sustained dislocation. So to, to keep us happy with bread and circus tactics, <laughs> the rum, the alcohol is there, the jamming and the winding up. I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but sometimes the truth hurts, but only the truth will set us free. So again, go upstream, mass addiction, mass dissociation, free market society, globalization. And we're going deep, 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 deep now. If you looked at the food we ate when we were in small tribes, hunter-gatherer tribes, about 10,000 before present, all of these were healthy. Breast milk, one on saturated fatty acid, meat, fish, fiber, low energy intake to energy. Um, Exertion ratio, physical activity, fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, soy, low omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, alcohol, moderate intake, wine, vinegar, beer. These are all fermented. Now we know it's not the alcohol, but the fermented bacteria in the products that's actually helping us. So people are going back to sauerkraut, fermented food. Olive oil, cocoa, herbs and spices. Herb! I think ganja was probably one of the first Plants were domesticated. The animals used to eat it. So we used to get it naturally from the plants and the, the animals. So we have a chronic endocannabinoid disorder because our body had came about, adapted to it. And that may be why we're all anxious and so on. Right? So the ganja tea, once it's legalized, I would recommend you have one at night. Okay?
There's nothing healthy about smoking because there may be some beneficial effects, but there are about 50,000 cancer-causing chemicals that are there. So we need to legislate and educate at the same time. You can't have them separate. Okay? You don't give a, a child a grenade and don't tell him of the consequences or you keep the grenade away from him. But when we look what happened after the agricultural revolution, which we describe as progress, we actually regress in devolution. Air pollution, smoking, endocrine disrupting chemicals, the plastics are breaking down to microplastics, into BPA, this phosphonyl A, which is a hormone disruptor, and it can explain some of the obesity, some of the cancers, because a lot of these are hormone sensitive ones, affect the diabetes. Inactivity, sleep deprivation. Now we know sleep is very important. My prof in med school told me that sleep was just a concept. He was so, so wrong. Your body rests and digests when you sleep. It's like one of those high-rise buildings in the States. Everybody's busy working, and when everybody goes home, the cleaning staff comes in. Our body works like that. That's why we have the day-night cycle. You go for sleep deprivation for days on at all, you could drop down dead. And we have evidence, natural evidence, why sleep is important. Natural evidence. Daylight savings time. When you lose at least an hour of sleep around the world, the rates of stroke and heart attack goes up. I guess it was very high. They said about 20%. And when you have an extra hour of sleep, when it goes the other way, six months later, levels go down. Natural experiment. We can follow it. Okay? So sleep is very important. And that's another reason why we, you have to ask yourself, health and productivity. More sleep for you, less time for the businesses, less profit. Labor is a liability, it's a cost. And to maximize profits, you have to minimize cost. So you privatize the gains and you socialize and environmentalize the cost. So we call these things anthropogens. Okay? Um, and it's defined as man-made environments and the byproducts, behaviors, and lifestyle encouraged by those environments, some of which have biological effects, which may be detrimental to human health. But this is the biggest picture of all. Our most important asset and liability is revealed. So I'm using economic terms in health. So our mental capital is the most important asset, our mind. And Bob Marley told us that, right? Emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, none but ourselves. So don't rely on your savior from outside. Right? So we know these things that affect it. Good parenting skills increase our mental... It's like a balance sheet. And then supporting teaching and education increases resisting peer pressure, social engagement. Other things, early adverse childhood experiences brings it down. Right, so let me go through quickly because Dr. Matson, I'm running out of time. Um, drug and alcohol abuse, social exclusion, stress. Right, when Nietzsche says what doesn't kill you make you stronger, he doesn't speak for the 99 who dies and doesn't live to tell the story. So we, and that's the same thing with medicine. We don't, we're not practicing evidence-based medicine anymore. We're practicing evidence-biased medicine. Okay, so let's, let's move on quickly. Right? And it affects learning identity, affects your decision making, conflict resolution, emotional sensitivity, cognitive resilience to deal with flexibly with difficult situations, not having a nervous breakdown. Oh, this is everything. But let's look at stress, the work environment, managerial style, participation and control, job insecurity, Skill utilization, a variety of workload and workplace identity, social relationships, right? And this comes down to all the disease I spoke about. It has to do with your cortisol, adrenaline, fight and flight. That's adaptive in the short term to make you get rid of difficult situation. But if it's chronic, you get wear and tear, and everything breaks down. Right? So we can so we now we say hypertension is as a result of social tension. So within, so without, so up, so down. The East had it right. 
And so we have to look at the macro levels, the systems, the wider society, the life course stages, the accumulation of positive and negative effects on health and well-being over the life course. So we have to look at these stage. But what's enabling this dysfunctionality to continue? The family dynamics. What we've been programmed, right, to think from since we were young. It reflects the systems on the outside. So if our monetary system is like a cancer that deregulates, that privatizes, that suppresses the immune system with structural austerity programs, it's going to invade every aspect of our communities, our lives. Our brains are being colonized now, and you don't even know it. Our bodies are being colonized with all these pollutants, and you don't even know it. It's a cancer. So, what is life value? What's our life capital? So I'm going to ask you some questions here. So what do you call that experience of connection with the cells, tissues, and organs of our bodies that motivates us to keep our physiological reserves in the best shape possible? Isn't this our physical capital? What do you call the experience of connection with our family, friends, schoolmates, co-workers, neighbors, and community that motivates us to invest in them and in us as we actualize their potential and their ours? Isn't this our social capital? Isn't social cohesion and a trustworthy environment our social capital? Do we have that? What are the drivers for that here in our society that's undermining it in the name of progress? What do we call the experience of connection with our thoughts and emotions and our worldview that motivates us to cope with the difficult situations when they arise without getting anxious, depressed, angry, or frustrated, and be at peace with others, with ourselves, others, and the world? Isn't this our mental capital? And then, while well, I was preparing this five years ago, was, I did a presentation similar to this, so this is basically upgraded, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So his love of God, referring to stewardship of all creatures and of all creation, inclusive of the life support systems of the planet, be they the air, the water, and soil of our planet, in other words, our environment. So if we take care of our life supporting systems, will they in turn not take care of us? Do we already live in abundance and don't even know it? Is love of neighbor referring to stewardship of the relationships with our family and community, and that if we take care of our families and communities, will they in turn not take care of us? And finally, is love of yourself referring to stewardship of your own body? And by taking care of your organs and body, will not our body and organs take care of us? Is this the secret to healthier living and the creation of a healthier nation? To love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Is stewardship of our bodies, our communities, and our natural resources not the same as love of country? and putting our country above self. We, have the, we, we intimate what we need to do in our anthems, in our <laughs> mottos, but you still don't see it right in front of our face. We go to church every day. And then this guy was on WinFM a couple of years ago, and he said this, rules plus regulation without relationship equals rebellion. And when you see a Christian, you want to know if they say, do you have a a relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he says, the kids don't get it. That's why they rebel, they don't come to church. But you bring it in physical terms. So I'm going to ask some questions here. How many of us take our gifted bodies for granted? None of us asked to come to the world. It was a gift from the Almighty. How many of us have a personal relationship with the cells, tissues, and organs of our bodies? How many of us know that our bodies are very forgiven when we continue to do harm to it? How many of us know that our body has an amazing capacity to heal itself? Most of us would be dead by now. We eat a lot of crap. 
Our body has a lot of resilience. And how many of us rebel or sin against our bodies because we do not understand how our body functions and we lack an understanding relationship with the rules and regulations of balance and harmony within? So it's simple ignorance, in a good sense, lack of knowledge, which can be remedied easily by providing knowledge. So, so I gave this um, lecture here, it's exactly here, about four and a half years ago, and I presented that. And then I came across this guy, John McMurtry. He was a medical model, a moral philosopher to explain where we are, and he provided his solution. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and his work is published and transformed from Latin America to Japan. He's the author and editor of three volumes, Philosophy and World Problems, published by UNESCO's and Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems. And his latest book is Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he came up with a new philosophy in 1996. His first paper was written in a public health journal. They don't get it as yet. He has a solution. It's called, it's a big word, don't get scared. It's called life value onto axiology. It's a general term for a value system which regards life and means of life to more coherently compressive rages of life as the sole real good, including the life support systems required to enable this process. And where he see we went wrong is with postmodernism and relativism. I mean, this is, if you probably understand that. This is where there's nothing objective in life. Truth is what you make of it. Life is what you make of it. But he, he proved them wrong. Life has objective value, universal value. And his whole thesis proved them wrong. And he thinks the life ground. You have to be grounded. You have to be anchored to steer well. You have to have a, a moral compass to guide you. And that can only come if you're grounded and anchored. So the life ground is the conditions of all life and substantive value. So all value derives from that. More simply express all the conditions required to take your next breath. All the life support system required for human life to produce and develop is the universal base of all value, which is the maximal development of the capabilities of living things relative to the degree of organic and social complexity. It's going to be a little technical, but I'm going to go through it quickly. So it's not anthrocentric, it's lifocentric. While religions, and this one opened my eyes, and a lot of people are going to be offended here, so please forgive me. Say, forgive Dr. Saheli, he's not sure what he's saying, and pray for me, rebuke me. While religions have featured the animating breath of life, they have attributed it to a transcendental creator so as to overlook its source in the creation itself. A kind of idolatry of man-made ideas. Who sustains us? Is it Mother Earth? So we're overlooking her. But we're only seeing the above, but we're not looking down. So religion is incomplete. You have to get the full picture to regain the spirituality. And UNESCO defines a life support system as any natural or human engineered construction, constructed or made system that furthers the life of the biosphere in a sustainable fashion. The fundamental attribute of life support system is that together they provide all the sustainable needs required for continuance of life. These needs go far beyond biological requirements. We are biopsychosocial beings, not biological, we're not robots. That is the program. Thus, life support systems encompass natural environmental systems as well as ancillary social systems required to foster societal harmony, safety, nutrition, medical care, economic standards, and the development of new technology. The one common thread in all of these systems is that they operate in partnerships with the conservation of global natural resources. This is UNESCO. This is not that Prof. McMurtry here. So this precedence is already there in little spades. And life capital, and this is the definition, the primary capital of any society or economy is life capital, abbreviated here. The wealth of means of life that produces more wealth of means of life and cumulatively yield through time, like species, ecological, social, technological, knowledge capital, which reproduces and grows through time and carrying capacity of life means. What's the converse? 
We've been, some, some people say we've been serving false gods. Well, we don't care about false capital here. Claim capital which does not directly or indirectly produce means of life through time is false capital and is inefficient in proportion to its misallocation of scarce economic resources to its growth. Money capital growth by non-defensive weapons. Trade with um, India. It was, it's arms they, they trade in there. Scraping the bottom of the barrel. Money capital, right? Manufa currency speculation. Production of life disabling consumer commodities. Recreational food. Not medicinal food or sacramental food. So, what's the solution? Rationing to human life needs or necessities. That's the solution. So, the different names, life needs, life necessities, means of life, life goods, that without which life capacities are reduced. Now, here's the interesting thing. No one in the whole world up to now has provided a strict criteria definition of what needs. You've heard of Maslow's needs, you've heard of basic needs, but no one has defined it. Because once you define it, you have strict criteria, principles, and measures to follow it. But I'm hoping it's by accident or oversight and not by design. People don't want us to see. Because once you give the economists, politicians, no wiggle room to stay with the criteria, principle, and definition, they have to do what needs to be done. So, universal human life necessities. These are the objective well-beings. You know, which one is Australia, um, New Zealand? They have this well-being metrics they're using, but these are subjective. So you have to have objective ones, and these are here. The atmospheric goods of breathable air, open space and light, the bodily goods of clean water, nourishing goods and waste disposal, the home and habitat goods of shelter from the elements, the environmental good of natural and constructed elements, all contributing to the whole. Those are the physical means of life, and the social means of life are the good of care through time by love, safety, and health structures, the good of human culture in music, language, art, play, and sport, and the good of human vocation and social justice. That which enables and obliges all people to contribute to the provision of these life goods, consistence with each enjoyment of them. And I can foresee, hopefully before I die, that we're going to have ministries of atmospheric goods, ministries of bodily goods, home and habitat goods, environmental goods. It's now all harmonized with the life support system of the universe. Soon finish. So the challenges that lie ahead. We're coming back home. Because we have lots of smart people here. Anybody knows Mr. Joseph, Tennyson Joseph? He's a senior lecturer at Cave Hill, political science. Very smart guy. And he wrote a paper called Towards a New Democracy and a New Independence, a program for the second independence revolution. He makes a bold claim that globalization has disempowered our policymakers. And that's why I empathize with them right now. I, I shouldn't empathize with them? Yes, you have to, because you're in the same situation, your hands are tied in more ways than you know from being able to act in the best interest of their people, and this can also be applied to the health policy spheres too. In the section entitled, The Negation of Democracy, The Return of Power Without Responsibility, he wrote, while we often focus on the economic consequences of globalization, we tend to forget that globalization has resulted in the erosion of our democracy. Under classic colonialism, the state enjoyed power without responsibility. In other words, the British colonial apparatus and its local representatives were able to wield power over our citizens, yet these colonial rulers were neither elected by nor were they accountable to the local population. The colonial state was therefore neither representative of local wishes nor was it responsible or accountable to any local aspirations. Many of us tend to forget that our independence movements were also democratic movements. By the winning of one man, one vote, we gave ourselves the capacity to elect governments of our own making who would make decisions according to the wishes of the majority. These governments were to be directly accountable to us and as a consequence could be removed once we felt that they had not conformed to our expectations. Our independence movements therefore moved the center of decision making from the colonial office in London and placed them in the hands of the local population. And here's a clincher. All of this has been undermined by globalization which has represented the old colonial problematic of power without responsibility in a new guise. 
Firstly, our new independent governments are now constrained in their policy choices and critical economic decisions are now being made more and more in the IMF, World Bank, and the G20 than in our domestic cabinet rooms. As the power of our domestically elected governments have decreased, they remain no less accountable for actions over which they have very little or no control. So whilst in the old days the colonial rulers enjoyed power without responsibility, today our local governments have responsibility without power, and international agencies enjoy power without responsibility. All of this negates the very essence of democracy, in which the right to self-determination and government by the consent of the governed are essential parts. So, there's a big movement worldwide, it's called the re-indigenization movement by the indigenous people in South America, Africa, Asia. And this is the rule, which seems to be the, the formula. To decolonize, we have to re-indigenize and revitalize. We, we don't have any indigenous people here, right? But we have something close, and even better. We think it's going to be our savior. Rasta. You ever heard the term of liberty? Take some time and study Rastafarianism. It's the third incarnation of a social movement that started with the Israelite movement, the Jesus movement, and now we have the Rastafarian movement. Liberty is the Rastafarian concept. I got this from Wikipedia. They make this up. Of righteous, ever-living, living. It's the sense of the realization that an energy or life force conferred by Almighty Jah exists within. And Jah is another name of God. God has many different names and faces. They're all pointing at the moon, all the leaders, showing us the right way, the unity of one world. But we're all focusing on the finger and fighting which has the better finger. This energy is the presence of Jah living, okay, within and flows to all people and all living things. This energy is the presence of Jah living within us and is often expressed in Rastafarian vocabulary as I and I, where the first eye refers to the Almighty, the second eye for oneself. A primary goal in Rastafarian meditation is maintaining awareness of I and I. A lot of Eastern philosophy, I and I. When, when the, the Hindu said Namaste, the divine in me meets the divine in you. We all have divinity in us and we don't even know it. A primary goal of Rastafarian life is to expand his or her liberty. In Rastafarian philosophy, liberty can be enhanced by intense prayer and meditation, often enhanced by the sacramental cannabis use. It's a psychedelic, not a psychotic medication. It opens your mind. You think about the prisons of your mind. That's what the authorities don't want us to do. I always question authority. Even question everything I say. Don't believe everything you're programmed to think. Reverend Ray Nagel taught me that. Adherence to an ital diet. Ital is vital. And I encourage all my patients to eat ital food. I only see those who have who are fake rasters who eat the, eat the meat and the, drink the alcohol, cricket disease, but those who are strict Rastafarians, very healthy life. And most important of all, loving behavior toward others. Liberty has a strong focus on living a natural lifestyle which includes the consumption of natural foods and growth of natural hair. This expression of love for others is done in recognition for central love energy within all people, a concept often referred to as one love, one heart, right? And you can have one life. Okay, so you have all prophets in the region, but you know, prophets are not accepted in their home, right? And you know what drew me to them? What do you think is the fundamental, the holy trinity in Rastafarianism? Our, I'm, I'm Catholic, I go to church, I hope I'm not going to be expelled tomorrow, so don't tell Father anything. <laughs> it's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's a hierarchy, a patriarchal, man-made system. More of them have done that. But the Rastafarians have it right. The Holy Trinity is Father, Mother, Child. Men and women are co-partners 
We are a differentiated aspect of a united whole. And that's the building block of society. So we may need to listen to them more often. Right? There's a song, try to seek to understand rather than be understood. So spend some time, try to understand them. Sit down and talk to them. And who was one of the founders who started up this? Marcus Garvey. He was here, MIA, MIS. Read his speech, very powerful. And refer to the unity and love of black people by black people. Soon finish. But did you know we are all of African descent? The science, this is not some ideology. Race is not scientific. It was an ideology that was created to make one superior over the other. And until we have one race superior over the other, they're always going to be war. I did mine. This is, this is my results. And the mitochondria leave is in Africa. So everybody on earth, if you go back, because we have to come from like a parent, and we look at the mitochondrial DNA, which comes from mother to mother, we can trace the maternal line all the way back to find the last common ancestor of all humans alive today, about 150,000 years ago. Hmm? Sand people. Right? So my parents from Lebanon, so the Middle East, that's right. And we look at the Y chromosome of the male, everybody can go back around 1600 from Africa. So if you do the calculations, we are all cousins of each other. At most, if you look at the most separated, 5,000 generations. One big family, the science, it's all about life. Why are we fighting each other? And then we migrated all over the world. Other animals adapt to the environment, but we go into environments we weren't initially in, and we adapt by our culture, our language. Anthropologists study these things here. So we are migratory people. So why are we not welcoming strangers? That's our legacy. That's our deep history, migrated over hundreds of thousands of years. And guys, evolution means process of change. Don't feel any way. Evolution is the technical details of the creation process. So we're trying to understand how, God, how God's mind works. Okay, the way forward, just like we take care of a child, we need to take care of our mother. Why treat people without changing what makes them sick? But you know, doctors were initial social scientists. Now we know legal drug pushers. A physician is obligated to consider more than a diseased organ, more even than the whole man. He must be the man in his world. So I'm a general internal medicine specialist. I discovered the wisdom of the body, the internal body politics, the body economics, the good governance rules that make sure the body functions properly. You can't have an unhealthy heart and have a healthy body. The same thing. So I'm opening up a new specialty if you want to. It's called general external medicine. And we try to fix and harmonize and synchronize and cogentanize the external economics, politics, sociology, spirituality. Virtual, one of the fathers of medicine. And I hope that we have a couple of politicians here. Medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. So our politicians are doctors of constituencies. You should have the pulse, find where the deficiencies are and the excesses. Have the resources liberalized so that you have unmet needs and gaps being met, so that everybody starts off in life on a full foundation. Medicine as a social science, as a science of human beings, has the obligation to point out problems and to attempt their theoretical solution. The politician, the practical anthropologist, must find the means for the actual solution. The physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. 
and social problems fall to a large extent within their jurisdiction. If I am not the patient's advocate, advocate who is, so whenever I'm in a conflicting situation between what's best for the patient or best for my superiors, I'm always going to side with the patient. Because I've been paid by them to serve them, not to make their lives easier upstairs. And they were paid by them to serve them. Everything is upside down. We've surrendered our sovereignty. That's why we have the structured dependency. But this information is always there. You must have community partners, healthcare team, and patients that are prepared, motivated, and informed. A healthcare organization that promotes continuity and coordination, encourage quality through leadership and incentives, organize and equip healthcare teams, use information systems, support self-management, and prevention. But the community has a role to do. We all of it it's together. We need to raise awareness and reduce stigma, encourage better outcomes through leadership and support, mobilize and coordinate resources, provide complementary services, and a positive policy environment. Going back up to the natural anthropologists. Strengthen partnerships, support legislative frameworks. Smoking laws needs to be passed as soon as possible. Integrate policies, health in all policies for one and all. We need a universal health care system, but a high quality universal health care system. Provide leadership and advocacy, but the last is important. Promote consistent financing. Do not become like the colonial masters and have homegrown austerity structural adjustment programs by not releasing the funds that are needed. And develop and allocate human resources. And guess what? Health promotion, we talk about disease prevention, 2016. The three pillars of health promotion, good governance. So I was still in my lane, I didn't come out. Strengthening governance and policies to make healthy choices accessible and affordable to all and to create sustainable systems that make whole of society collaboration real. Healthy cities create greener cities that enable people to live and work and play in harmony and good health and health literacy. Dark can out dark, only light. Hate can out out hate, only love. Disinformation can out out disinformation, only knowledge and truth. Martin Luther King was the first two. This one said it came naturally here. This is a lecture, right? So I'm giving you information, spreading knowledge, and hopefully some wisdom. Dean Onish, president of of preventive medicine. This cannot compete against the disease management system. Luckily, he got Medicare to pay for some of his natural means. If he didn't get Medicare to cover it, it would have been gone. His mantra, eat well, move more, Stress less, love more. Not make love more, love more. Okay. Feeling sad and depressed? Are you anxious? Worried about the future? Feeling isolated and alone? You might be suffering from capitalism. Symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of powerlessness, fear, Apathy, boredom, cultural decay, loss of identity, extreme self-consciousness, loss of free speech, incarceration, suicide, or revolutionary thoughts, and death. And this is, uh, if you go to my website, if you have time, this is my strap line there. Knowledge always win in the end, but not unless and until it is known. So are we ignorant because of this accident, or is it by design? I mean, the policy makers now understand and sees, maybe they can help create that facilitating environment. And this really summarizes it. If you have an apple, and I have an apple, and we exchange these apples, then you and I will still each have an apple. But if you have an idea, and I have an idea, 
When we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. So you can have infinite knowledge growth, but not infinite material growth. Teachers, we live in a world where diamond is more expensive than water, but diamond can't save our lives. Why do stockbrokers get paid more than nurses? If you get sick, you want a stockbroker to look after you? So our value system is all a mess. So we have a value system disorder. We value money over life. So money value trumps life value. You can either have one guy lifting a billion pounds by himself, and it takes many years of planning and preparation, or you can have a billion people each lifting one pound, and it takes a mere moment. This is the power of unity. And the last slide, I'm a doctor, so I'm going to give you free advice, okay? So I'm not going to charge you. So a holistic approach to the real purpose-driven life. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. The Rastas are leading with the classification of ganja from medicinal ganja, recreational, and spiritual. So we have spiritual food, medicinal food, and recreational food. The junk food is, fast food is recreational food. There's no life value. It's just more profits and addictions and so on. Drink plenty of water, 8 to 10 glasses a day. Exercise half an hour daily, every day. Increase your exposure to sunlight. That's why we have a lot of osteoporosis, vitamin D deficiency, the sun. So it's better to go out and walk than go to a gym. And for you guys, eat a lot of greens. They will, the chemicals, the nitrates will go under your skin. Once the sunlight hit it, you release nitric oxide, your natural Viagra. Don't take it. Just don't exercise for a week. Go out and exercise for a week or play tennis. And you realize that when the occasion arises, you're able to arise better to the occasion. <laughs> so we're too much indoors. You need to get some sunshine and sunlight. Sleep, we you know it's not a concept, seven to eight hours. Reduce stress. Meditate. Help create life-enabling and supportive environments at home, work, and neighborhood. Don't smoke, don't drink alcohol, right? Our body doesn't have a cigarette deficiency or alcohol deficiency. It doesn't have an orange juice or coke deficiency. It has a water deficit. It has an energy imbalance, right? So our food has become toxic, rich, nutrient poor. Eat from God's factory, which is the soil, rather than man's factory, which is the supermarket. Not natural common sense. Get annual checkups and screen for breast, cervical, prostate, and colon cancer because our environment are carcinogenic. Obesogenic, carcinogenic, criminogenic, all the negative genics. And get involved in life value community building as only by a life grounded, bottom up, top down, and inside out approach would you be able to effect the needed change and create true unity in all of our communities. Life value in community is the cure for all of the ills of our systems. Thank you.